Our call to worship today comes from 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verses 10 to 13. David praised the Lord in the presence of the whole assembly, saying, Praise be to you, Lord, the God of our Father of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Yours, the Lord, is the greatness and power and the glory and the majesty and splendor. For everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things, and in your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. Now, our God, we give you thanks and praise your glorious name. So if you would stand with us, we're going to have our opening prayer, and then we'll get right into worship. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for today. We thank you for Father's Day and for what our fathers mean to us. We pray that you would just help us to have open hearts and open minds for the service today, for whatever you have for us, and just help us to be able to focus in on you and just praise you in your name. Amen.
morning. We are happy to have you with us. Um, Pam has a presentation, so we'd like all the dads to come up and stand along the front, if you would, please. So if you are a dad, come on up. We want to honor you today. Today is your day. And we are so thankful for our fathers, aren't we? And um, fathers mean an awful lot to us, so...
You don't. I just fill in there. Okay. All right, we have a few announcements to make. Um, nursery starting back in July, so we need some volunteers, and if you'd be interested in helping, hopefully once a quarter, um, then see me so I can get the training materials to you as well. That would be great. We, can, we, need, we need it. Next Sunday, June 27th, community dinner. If you would like to help, you need to see Pam. Um, she's in charge of that, and we're going to be eating in person in the fellowship hall and be reaching out to our community. So next Sunday. And all the camps are coming up. Um, if you have any kids or teens that want to go, see me and let me know, and we will get the information to you, get them registered for any of our summer camps. And Bible school um, is July 25th through the 29th. We got the pool booked for Thursday the 29th, so we're going to have a family uh, swimming party. So, uh, and there are flyers out on the um, Welcome Center um, that you can take with you to hand out to any kids you think would like to come. And I'll be getting some posted around town hopefully this week. And um, our women's conference, if you are interested in going, there are forms hanging out in the bulletin board. You get, get your money back into me um, by September 1st if you're interested in going. Then we'll figure out carpooling and all of that later on. And any old CDs anybody has, um, I'm still needing some for Camp Crafts, so if you have some old CDs, bring them in. I've gotten a few donations, so um, thank you very much for that. And is that it? All right, we're going to take up our tithes and offerings. And um, thank you for your faithfulness. And, and we are so grateful for how God has provided for us um, as a church and all of the things that we are able to do. So you can give online at dunkirknazarene.org. You can bring it up as we're singing. You can mail it in, bring it in, whatever. Uh, we just need to be remain faithful to God. And we can't outgive Him, can we? we? We owe Him so much, and we can never repay Him for everything He's given us. So, all right, we're going to pray. Dear Lord, we just thank you again for all of your blessings. We thank you for our church and our church family. Just take this offering, bless the gift and the giver, and just further it for your kingdom in your precious name. Amen.
praying for Pastor Tom and Sheila as they're on their way home. They got caught in some of that bad weather yesterday, so we just need to pray that they make it home safely. And the altars are always open. If you have a need or if you just want to come praise God for something, the altars are always open. So stand with us as we sing. Children's Church kids teaching, but we have a couple videos um, to watch first. Well, hey, good morning. It's Pastor Tom here, and we are traveling home from Gulf Shores, Alabama. And I just wanted to pop on here and wish you guys a happy Father's Day. God bless you today and have a great day. 
Well, hey, good morning. Okay, a lot of you um, are, were very fortunate to grow up with good dads, and I was, and my dad happened to be able to be here today. Um, and I know some of you didn't, and, but you know what? God is your dad. God is your dad. I have a little story to read you. There was a young boy who had just gotten his driving permit, and he asked his father, who was a minister, if they could discuss the use of his car. And his father took him to his study one day and said, I'll make you a deal. You bring up your grades, study your Bible a little, and get your hair cut, and we'll talk about it. Well, after about a month, the boy came back again to his father and said, can we discuss the use of the car? And again, they went to the father's study, and he said, son, I'm real proud of you. You've brought your grades up, and you've studied the Bible diligently, but you didn't get your hair cut. The young man waited a moment and said, You know, Dad, I've been thinking about that. You know, Samson had long hair. Moses had long hair. Noah had long hair. And even Jesus had long hair. To which the father replied, Yes, you're right. But they also walked everywhere they went. <laughs> and then there was a five-year-old Becky answered the door when the census taker came by and she told her census taker that her daddy was a doctor and wasn't home because he was performing an appendectomy. And then there, one other one that I want to read to you. And a little child in church for the first time watched the ushers pass by the offering plates. When they neared the pew where he sat, he looked up at his daddy and said, Daddy, you don't have to pay for me. I'm under five. <laughs> So our dads are, are very special, and uh, we're going to 
be in Luke chapter 15, and we're going to talk today about the loving father and um, the story of the prodigal son. And this is a very familiar story to all of us, but I want, there's some things in here I know that God's revealed to me that I hadn't thought of before. And you know, Dad, you have such a powerful influence on your children, as we will see that this father did. So we're going to start at verse 11. Luke chapter 15, verse 11. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons, and the younger son spoke to his father and said, Father, give me a share of the property of the family. So the father divided his property between his sons, and not long after that, the younger son packed up all he had, and he left for a country far away. There he wasted his money on wild living. He spent everything he had. The whole country ran low on food. So the son didn't have what he needed. He went to work for someone who lived in that country. That person sent him to the fields to feed the pigs. The son wanted to fill his stomach with the food the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. We're going to pause there for a minute. And the first thing that we notice with this younger son is that he was selfish. He wanted to go his own way, and he wanted to have fun, no responsibility, nothing to take care of. Does that sound familiar? In this day and age, how many of us see kids around us all our time, or maybe even our own kids sometimes, who don't want to take responsibility for anything? Mom, do I really have to clean my room? Or Dad, do I have to mow the lawn or whatever? Well, yes, you do. <laughs> that is part of growing up, part of learning. And this son had not learned this lesson completely. You know, every action we take has consequences good or bad. And this, at this point, this young son is at the bottom of his pit, and he has the sad, bad consequences for his actions. But, you know, he has, at this point, he has no concept of how he has hurt his father. I cannot even imagine what this father felt like when his son said, I want to leave, Dad, I want to go. And we sometimes will do that to our father. We end up going our own way and wanting what we want and not even paying attention to what God's telling us. This kid left the safety and comfort of his home where his father had provided everything. And how many times have we done that? Have we said, no, God, I've got it. I can handle this. I, I don't need you. And then we leave and we get ourselves into trouble and then we're sitting there wondering, how in the world did we get here? Well, we turn away from our father sometimes. And sometimes not always even on purpose. Sometimes we just aren't paying attention. But, you know, father has a plan for us. And we sometimes will selfishly spend our money and our time and not caring about what Jesus has for us. We waste our time and talents. And sometimes even our families in selfish pursuits. I don't know how many times... We go out to restaurants anymore, and families are all sitting there all on a different phone. And you kind of wonder, why are we doing wasting time? Always on our phones and always doing those things. And there's a picture I had seen on the internet of a, of a husband and wife laying in bed, and the husband's on the phone, and his wife's just laying there like, what's happening? And then the next picture, she's gone. And it just makes us to stop and think, you know, are we wasting time and being selfish with what this, like this son was? Jesus provides everything that we need, and that's the key. Jesus provides it. So all we have to do is follow him and not turn away from what he wants us to do. Verse 17. Then he began to think clearly again, and he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough food to eat? And here I'm sitting out here dying from hunger. I will get up and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and I have sinned against you. I am no longer fit to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So the younger son is now at the bottom of his pit and he finally gets it. He finally sees, oh boy, where am I at? I need my father. He finally sees the errors of his ways and he realizes that he's in his deep pit because of his selfishness and rebellion. 
He's come to the place that he's going to, he's now willing to humble himself, admit he's wrong, admit he needs his father, and be willing to do what it's going to take to get him, get him back in place. And he's even at this point willing to be a servant and not even be his father's son again at this point. But we can't grow and we can't develop in our walk with Christ until we see our need for him. And until we come to that place to realize we can't save ourselves. We have nothing of value because of the sin that's in our hearts and that's there. We sometimes think we have it all together. We've got it on things under control. Well, you know what? I got news for you. We don't. And Satan likes to tell us that. And he likes to make us think that, hey, you can do this. You don't need help. You can do this. And gives us those lies. But we have to accept the truth that we can't do anything. We can't even breathe on our own. Because God created it that way. He created us for relationship with him. And um, we need to allow the Holy Spirit to convict us and work in us. And work through us. And we have to accept the truth that we can't save ourselves. We can't do anything. And this is all a part, you know, we hate to admit that we're wrong. How many of you hate to admit you're wrong? Is there anybody? I know I'm not the only one who hates to admit that at times. And we sometimes worry so much about being right that we end up sacrificing relationships because of that. Because we've always got to be right. We've always got to prove ourselves right. And I don't know um, how many of you men are ones like when you're traveling, you don't want to stop for directions. Anybody else know, you know that too? Because we've taken some long cuts, as Kevin calls them at times, and I'm going, why don't you just stop and ask for directions? You know, and I don't know if it's a guy thing or not. But anyway... Sometimes we have to admit we need to know what direction we need to go. And we need a road map. We need Christ to tell us, you know, what direction we are going. And in our culture today, there are so many, like, self-help books. And go see a counselor. Go get on this medicine. Go talk to this person. Go do this. And not that those things are bad. Sometimes Christ works through those. However, our first instance ought to be going to him first. All of those other things are extra things that God uses sometimes to go through us. And, you know, there are times people do need to take medicine or who do need to be, you know, go see counselors or whatever. And that's fine because God provides those for us. But those should be the last resort. Christ should be our first resort that we go to when we need things. And our culture is also has its own truth. Whatever your truth is, is your truth. My truth is my truth. There's nothing in, I don't need Christ. I can go to heaven. I'm a good person. Well, that's not true. We all need Christ. And we need to make sure that we are sharing that with others of how much they need Christ as well. Because we can't make it to heaven without Jesus and the sacrifice that he made for us. And we need to just always be there for other folks too. Once we've got Christ in our hearts, we need to be there to help others also find Christ. And to also never give up on somebody. Some of you uh, may know the L.J. Stone Company. Well, Larry Stone's son Todd went to my home church and still goes to my home church where I grew up. And I, his wife prayed for something like 20 or 25 years for him. But when he got saved, I will tell you, he was a completely changed man. And that's the radical change God wants to do in each and every one of us. Now, granted, some of us didn't have some of the um, issues that others have where you may not see the dramatic changes as you do in some. But Christ wants to do those dramatic changes in our hearts. And that's what this young son finally got to that place where he was ready to admit that he needed Jesus. Verse 20. So he got up and went to his father. While the son was still a long way off, the father saw him and was filled with tender love for his son. He ran to him, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. The son said to the father, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer fit to be called your son. But the father called to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattest calf and kill it, and let's have a feast and celebrate. 
The son of mine was dead and now he is alive again. He was lost and now he is found. So they began to celebrate. There's a few things about this father that amazed me. For one, he saw his son a long way off. So what does that tell us about this father? He was looking for his son. He was pursuing him, trying to find any evidence that this son was coming back. Well, what does Jesus do for us? He pursues us. He's always looking for whatever he can do to draw us into him and help us to grow in our relationship with him. And this, the father was looking for him, and, and I can only imagine every morning he would get up and, oh, is my son, any, any chance he's coming today? Just like Jesus does with us. Is there any chance this child's going to come home today? And how in the world, I don't understand how people can't see God's grace and can't accept his grace. When you have this free gift to you, free to you, but cost Christ his life, but he's willing to give it to you. And I cannot even imagine Christ on the cross knowing that not everybody would accept his gift, but he gave it anyway. So the father embraced him and loved him. There was not one mention of a mistake. That father did not say, well, I'm glad to have you back, son, but how in the world did you spend all that money? Why did you take off? There's not one mention of anything that son did wrong. He was just accepted back into his father's heart. And then he gives him a party. Now his son was lost, but has been found. You know, Jesus does the same for us. And when somebody gets saved, there's more of a party in heaven for that one lost soul that came back than for all of us who have been Christians for a long time. And, of course, Jesus obviously loves us just as much. But he knows he's already got us. It's the ones that aren't here, that aren't with him yet, that he is looking after. And we also need to be rejoicing that way. We need to be ready and willing to help and be excited. I had a few weeks ago back in Children's Church, and I, um, I don't necessarily do an altar call every week back there, but that particular day, I felt God say, I want you to, to ask the kids. And I had three kids that got saved um, for the first time back there. And I was so, it was exciting. And I told them, I said, you need to go tell somebody that you asked Jesus into your heart today. And they were so, so excited. And you know, dads in our society today are portrayed as stupid. And so many of the TV shows, I, I can't even, I'm appalled at some of the ways they portray dads. They make them sound ridiculous and stupid. They make them sound like the, the, they're not of any value. And there's no respect for dads in so many of the shows and games and things nowadays. And we need to respect our dads. And we need to be grateful for who they are. We need to honor them. And our society is, is making it almost, well, in their minds, it's making it almost sinful in some ways to be a, to be a dad or to be a, a, a man. They're not respecting it the way that God wants us to. God designed dads to love their children, show them how to love and respect their mother. God expects fathers to be the spiritual leaders of their families. And, you know, this father represents exactly that. And he represents exactly the way God is. And did you know that the father, notice the father didn't even mention the money that he had spent or the pain he had caused or anything. He just accepted him right back. And he let God do the work to bring his son to repentance. So this dad wasn't trying to get his son in. I assume he prayed for him while he was gone. But he let God do the work that needed to be done. Just as um, God does for us. And... Uh, I found some statistics and some information about dads, you know. If a mother does not go to church, but a father does, a minimum of two-thirds of their children will end up attending church. In contrast, if a father does not go to church, but the mom does, on an average, two-thirds will not attend church. And another study focused on Sunday school and found similar results of the impact. When both parents attend Bible study in addition to the Sunday service, 72% of their children will attend Sunday school when they grow up. When only the father attends, it's 55%. 
But listen to this. When only the moms go and the fathers don't, only 15% of those kids will go to church when they grow up. And when neither parent goes, only 6% of those children will go when they're grown. And another survey found if a child is the first person in household to become a, ch a Christian, there's a 3.5% probability everybody else in the household will. If the mother's the first one, it's 70%, 17% probability everybody else. But dads, listen to this. When the father is the first one, there's a 93% probability that everybody in that household will become a Christian. You know, dads, you make a difference. You make a huge difference in kids' lives. And I will tell you that um, growing up, my dad and mom both, but dad especially, made church a priority. If I wasn't dying in bed, we were at church. I mean, there just was no question about it. Couldn't argue. We just, we were there. But you know what? That's why I'm here now. That is why I'm here now, is because of their leadership, of getting us to church and making it important and being happy about it. You know, they weren't dragging us to church. They were excited to go, so we were excited to go. And we need to do that same for our kids. Verse 25. The older son was in the field, and when he came near the house, he heard the music and dancing. So he called one of the servants, and he asked him what was going on. Your brother has come home, the servant replied. Your father has killed the fattest calf, and he's done this because your brother is back safe and sound. The older brother became angry. He refused to go in, so his father went out and begged him. But his, he answered his father, Look, all these years I've worked and slaved for you. I've always obeyed your orders, and you've never given me even a young goat so I could celebrate. But this son of yours wasted your money with the prostitutes, and now he's come home, and you kill him, the fattest calf. My son, the father said, you're always with me. Everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad. Your brother was dead, and now he's alive again. He was lost, and he's found. And when I think about this, this reminds me sometimes of some of us Christians at times when we get someone that gets saved at the last minute on their deathbed in the hospital, that they're going to get the same reward in heaven that we get. And we're sitting here being the other son going, wait a minute, God, I've served you 50 years. How in the world are you doing this for this one that's been, you know, a Christian 10 minutes before they die? But the older son lost out. Think of all the celebrating he lost out. We had a fantastic party yesterday for Tana for her birthday. And think about all the things that everybody got to do. And this son is missing out on that kind of a party. He was bitter and he wasn't even a bit moved. He wasn't even excited his brother was home. I, I'm sitting here thinking, well, if my brother or sister were gone like that, I'd be thrilled to death if they came home. I mean, I can't imagine being bitter about it. You know, and sometimes... We also get bitter, and we're not even moved about what Christ has done for us. Sometimes we take it for granted. In fact, most of the time we take it for granted. I sometimes sit and think, you know, that Jesus was willing to give his very life for us, and we sometimes just throw it aside and don't even think twice about it. You know, and we in the church have lost our awe for God. When was the last time... You sat down and either read something in the Bible or listened to a praise song, and you were just so overwhelmed by God that you couldn't do anything. The tears just started flowing. Think about the last time that happened to you. Every once in a while in my devotions, I'll turn on some music in the background, and sometimes I do. I just sit at my computer desk and I just cry, listening and just taking in who God really is. He is a father who cares more for us than we can even imagine. And we as parents think we love our children or grandchildren, but to think God loves us a thousand thousands of times more than that. You know, we sometimes treat God like a genie. You know, we wake up, okay, God, today I need this and today I need that. And, oh, by the way, I don't have time to pray. I don't have time to do my devotion today, but I'll, I'll talk to you later. I need this or that. And we treat his love and his gift as that father with nothing. We owe him everything. We owe him our very lives back. 
Now we may not and hopefully won't have to die for our Christianity like so many around the world are, but everything we do should be given back to him. And I know, you know, sometimes even when you're in the middle of folding laundry and doing dishes, sometimes it feels very monotonous. But you know what? We should do everything back to Christ with his glory in mind. That we are going to glorify him and be grateful for what we have. Our culture has rejected Jesus. And it breaks my heart to think now that there's laws and mandates. You can't talk about Jesus anywhere. And Jesus gave us warning that this would happen. But to see it in reality is a little hard sometimes to accept. And right now, there are three pastors in Canada in jail right now because they went against their laws or mandates or whatever, and they were preaching about Jesus. There have been many Christians arrested all around for praying for people in front of abortion clinics to help or teachers being fired for not using the correct pronouns and praying for, you know, or praying for students or with students. You know, we've, we've rejected, our, our nation and our world has just rejected Jesus. We kill 4,000 babies a day through abortion. We try to change people from who God created them to be through drugs and surgeries. We treat each, everybody like your germs and you're, we're going to die if we're around each other. I mean, we treat each other with such hate sometimes. I can't even imagine how broken Christ's heart is right now. And we've taken God out of every place in our culture. Some have tried to even take him out of the church. I've even seen some videos sometimes where um, people are talking with God and he says, well, I'm not even invited into that church. Have we gotten so selfish around all of the things that we're trying to do for God that we've missed God himself? And that, you know, and the programs and things are great and we need to be doing ministries, but it's all for naught if we lose that direct connection with God as to why we're doing it. And he is here. And the best news is, and we need to pray for all of those that are losing out because of their selfishness or because they're afraid to let go of something. How many of us have ever, God said, I want that. And we're like, no, I'm not ready to let go of that yet. I'm not ready to let go of that, Christ. But that's exactly what Jesus wants. He wants us to give him everything that we have and be willing to let him work. Because even though we have things that are good, Jesus is something so much better for us than what we can even imagine. And sometimes we just don't want to admit and ask forgiveness. You know, God, I just, I, I just, I'm just not ready for that. Well, here's the best news. God the Father is ready for you whenever you're ready. He is always there. I, um, I want to read a, a paragraph out of when Pastor Tom and Sheila and Kevin and I went to um, the district assembly. They gave away the book, a book from Dr. Bowling from all of that called Windows and Mirrors. And this is all about parables about Jesus. And I want to read this little paragraph that he had written. And this was Dr. Bowling telling about himself. And he says, when I was 15, I ran away from home. It still embarrasses me to think about it, but some incidental disagreement with my folks made me think I was old enough to strike out on my own. And I had about $45 saved up for mowing lawns, which seemed like a lot of money at the time. So after school, with that money burning a hole in my pocket and an adolescent rebellion stirring in my mind, I bought a bus ticket from my little town in western Ohio to Dayton. And f from there, I bought a ticket to Indianapolis. And when I boarded that bus to Indianapolis, I realized I had made a mistake. But how could I go back? It was almost midnight by the time I reached Indianapolis and there was no one to meet me. No place to stay. My $45 had dwindled to about 20 something. I hadn't come home from school and my parents had no idea where I was. Finally about midnight I called them from a payphone and that conversation is still burned in my mind. Where are you? Indianapolis. How did you get there? On the bus. Are you okay? Yes. No, I want to come home. Sure. After talking to my parents, I bought a bus ticket back to Dayton, and a few hours later, I stepped off the bus in the wee hours of the morning, my mother and father waiting for me. It was my mother who set the tone. They were no harsh words, no stern looks. Instead, there was rejoicing, hugs, and kisses. It wasn't what I deserved, 
but it was what I needed at, in that moment of grace. And that's what God does for us too. He is there. He's not going to stand there and tell you. He will convict you of your sins to bring you to that place. But then once you are there and you accept him, he's not going to remember your sins again. They go in the sea of forgiveness and he will never bring them up again. God is ready to forgive us completely and our sins are always forgiven and buried in the sea of forgiveness and there's nothing he can't and won't forgive. All we have to do is ask. That's the simple part. It, it's so simple, but yet we make it so difficult that we have to clean ourselves up or we, and once we're a Christian, that we have to be this perfect person. Well, none of us are perfect. Jesus is the only person that ever walked on the face of this earth that was perfect, and he gives us the example. So all we can do is strive for as much perfection as we can get to, and it's more of perfection in heart, not necessarily our actions. So my challenge to you is to think about, are you the older son who has rejected Jesus? And are you rebelling and being selfish and wanting to go on your, on your own way? Or have you maybe have given your life to Christ, but you've still got a piece of you you don't want to let go and you don't want to give up? Or are you that younger son who's ready to ask for forgiveness and again, maybe it's not asking for your original sin because you've already done that. Maybe this is something else that you've made a mistake or that you haven't, again, haven't given up. And something else has crept back into your life because sometimes we bring things to the altar and then we pick it back up. I know I can't be the only one that's done that before too. But sometimes we, and we just need to be totally surrendered because, you know, it's with total surrender to Christ as this younger son did is where we finally get the freedom that Jesus has for us. And I know it doesn't make sense, you know, sometimes, but think about this, you know, you have children, they play in your backyard. I know when um, Abby was really little, we were like, we got to put a fence up because we don't want her getting down into some of these crevices and holes. And so they tend to stay up really close to the house because they don't know where their boundaries are. As soon as you build that fence around, they know they're protected and they are free to go through that whole yard. That's the way it is with Christ. When we know that he is in our hearts and we have his direction, we're free to move and go do what he wants us to do. And know that he will always give us the direction that we need to go. I, I love this story because this, this, you know, this father just accepted his son back and just said, come here, you're mine. And he didn't treat his son like a servant, just like Jesus doesn't treat us. We're not, you know, all of a sudden we get saved and Jesus isn't like, okay, you're a servant, now you gotta do this and this and this. He's like, no, you are my child. And I love that song of who you say I am, that we, I am a child of God, and I am that because he says I am. Doesn't matter what the world says to you. He says you're his child, and that's all that matters. And we need to make sure that we are also sharing with others that they are also children of God, and that he loves them just like he loves us. Maybe you have one place in your heart you're holding on to, it's time to surrender it. It's time to give everything back to your loving Father who is here with us today. Tyler's going to come and we're going to sing Good, Good Father. And so we're going to stand and sing that. And as we're singing, if there's something you need to give back to the Father or you need to give him the first time, or maybe you have a wayward child you need to give back to him, that God will lead them back. You will stand with us. We're going to sing that. The altar again is always open. But just remember of the loving Father of God he is and how much he loves you as we sing this song. Oh, I'm going to grab my tablet here.
love us so much. We only get a small taste of that here as parents and grandparents. And we're so grateful for that. And Lord, we're thankful for your word and the stories that we can hear today to show us what a loving father you are. And Lord, there may be some here that have other things on their mind that they didn't come to the altar, but just help us to, in our own private time with you, to share those things and surrender those things to you. I pray you'd be with the one who has come. She would just minister to her needs. And Lord, just minister to each and every one of us. And have give us that individual relationship with us that you want so desperately. And help us to be so desperate for you that we will do whatever it takes to have that deep walk with you. We just thank you again for our fathers, Lord. And help us to just appreciate them and the fathers who are gone. Help us to just appreciate those memories that we have. And Lord, I pray for each and every father that's here and the fathers all over our nation, all over the world, that you would bring them to the place where they will follow you and they would follow your footsteps as fathers in their own households. Just bless each and every one and help us in whatever celebrations we get to do today. And just bring us back together Wednesday night. And we love you, Lord. In your precious name, amen. Thank you. You are dismissed. And remember, no service tonight. And go enjoy time with your dads.